questions, discussion points, things to talk about. Exciting stuff. That was close. We'll go through like we did last time with discussion points first, and there'll be a couple point pace, places where I'll jump out and talk about some other things. Well, expand on it. So today we'll talk about chapter five, sorting out the commission, Wells and Beta's book. And Maeve, you're up first. got questions, I'm going to pull up a paper uh, that, I, that I wanted to address one of your questions with. I didn't make slides on this one, but it was because of what you just said that I, I decided that actually there's a good one to bring up, so go ahead. Um, hold on a minute. Um, 
Yeah. Okay, great. So, back to your question about, or your more of your comment that you think that there should be original life research associated with the um, possible role that lightning played in the original life, and also, um, I think you really got to an interesting point about the possible connection of lightning, volcanic activity, and chemistry. Um, so you're in very good company with that idea. Uh, this is an idea that I would say that Stanley Miller and Harold Jury started to explore. And we didn't have much data on the effect of, of um, volcanic plumes with respect to lightning strikes in a model system um, until uh, very recently, I would say. We got more data on it, and that's because I mentioned a few classes ago that Stanley Miller had archived his samples over decades. And some of those samples were based upon a, start, a spark discharge apparatus, like this right here. Now you all recognize uh, this General Miller Urey apparatus here, where he has his electrodes in the sphere here that represents the atmosphere. And then he has the liquid stage down here where that's maybe an ocean or a lake. And then he's, he's heating that up um, and driving right, through a cycle here. He has a condenser here that's cooling down. So it's, it's condensing the water vapor here and that's coming down and heating here so that, that uh, vapor goes up. Um, what you notice here is that there is a steam aspirator right there. And that was their earliest attempt to see how what lightning, what, um, a, what a volcanic plume might add to this by taking some of the molecules and, and circulating them up into the electrode there. And so what you see here is the, um, the title of this paper, this appeared in the journal Science in 2008, is the Miller Volcanic Spark Discharge Experiment. And you see here, uh, people that worked with Miller, for example, uh, Jeff Beta was his student in the 1960s, and Jim Cleaves was his last PhD student in the 1990s. Um, and as I mentioned before, Antonio Lascano was somebody that had worked with him who's uh, more of a uh, senior scientist when he started to uh, interact with with uh, Stanley Miller. And here's just what you're talking about. Lightning strikes, right, and kind of uh, what looks like a, a rich cloud of material. So obviously a, a contemporary picture, but their idea about where you might get a lot of this chemistry going. And there's their plot or table of amino acids and the concentrations, relative concentrations of these amino acids found in this experiment. And what you see is glycine here is, is what is normalized to. So that's given a one. And then from here, there's some of the amino acids that we spoke about last time. Some of the naturally occurring ones like valine and asparagine there and some, a, a good number of ones that we don't find. Uh, in nature or they're not among the 20. So this is, I think, a very fruitful environment for creating a lot of the molecules that, that we need for life. And as I mentioned last time, that uh, because we had a slow evolution of the formation of land on Earth, it's, and a lot of it was done by volcanic activity early on, uh, it looked like or it looks like we probably had many small islands scattered around, as, as Beta said. And because of that, with the plumes, right, that can uh, enhance lightning strikes, it looks like a good place to bring all this together. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, later as well, about how we could have different environments uh, interacting. But this is a great one where you have, uh, you have the nascent dry land being the, you know, the early dry land being this volcano and you have an atmosphere and you have an energy associated right all in that same place that can give you these molecules and you can imagine them being 
generated in the atmosphere um, or precursors to them generated in the atmosphere uh, and then raining down onto the land below, which would be the volcano. What a perfect place, right? You, can, you think that that is, is somewhat serendipitous in that you're not doing these strikes over the ocean, perhaps, where if they rain down, they'll get diluted, right? This is great. You know, they could rain down and be on, coating this dry land that's uh, popped out of the ocean. So I think it's a, it's a really nice idea for a uh, possible place where life gets, gets some of its early material. Okay. Any other, uh, so you have your uh, references there. Any other questions, comments about today's point? It's a fun fact. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's interesting. Um, so it's a nice example how originalized studies bring you into all these different topics and that you know, there's so many things. It almost seems sometimes like everything we learn about might be relevant to the original life and we have to be careful, right? Because, okay, maybe it was and maybe it wasn't. Um, but I think it's easy to say that solving this problem, understanding it, is it's an understatement to say it's multidisciplinary, right? It, it contains so many parts. Okay, let's move on to the next discussion point. Kayla. Um, well, first, this isn't really related to my discussion point. Oh. I just like, looked up about the Earth's crust, and that's just a contour map of like how thick it is. So between like 10 kilometers like on the ocean and it's 70 is the highest that that's like in the Himalayas. So that's just really thick. Um, yeah, so this is based on your question. Uh, in last last class, how thick is it? Mm -hmm. And um, most of the continents it looks like are between thirty and forty five kilometers thick. So is anything striking to you about this? Greenland. Well, or there could be multiple things, but but when you look at this, what what are some of the things that you know if you if you didn't know this before and, and I'll admit I for sure didn't have these thicknesses memorized and I wasn't about to guess on them. But <coughs> what is it that, you know, look at the relative heights and, and tell me if, if something to you is you know, just kind of interesting. Nothing's interesting. It is interesting, yeah. but... I'll tell you some stuff that I find interesting is, is what is the relative depth of the ocean versus the Earth's crust? It's about a quarter as thick. Yeah. Did you expect that? Somewhat, but not that much. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? That's thin, right? When you, I mean, you, you see an image of the Earth and you, and you think about, right, that thin veneer of water on there, well, and then you got that crust there, so the, that crust is, is pretty thin there, right? I mean, that's, you're talking 10 kilometers thick, and, well, you can see from 10 to 30, right? You know, you, you have uh, the edge of the continents there, so that's 20, right? So you get a factor of two there. It's pretty amazing uh, how thin that is, right? That thin veneer that separates us from complete annihilation by the inner earth, right? Oh no, yeah, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that that's that to me is pretty sh striking. And then you know what's also striking is that yeah, it's only from the bottom of the ocean up there it's only 30, but then we have Himalayan peaks that are rising up another 40, right? And it's kind of amazing as well. Okay, all of this is quite interesting. Um, you had other ones too, right? Yeah, I have like. Uh, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject there. So I went and looked this up too, and we, we came up upon the same uh, U.S. Geological Survey site. Um, so that was good. I, uh, and, um, hold on a second. Sorry about that. Let's see. Short. Uh, let's say I named it something different. Okay. Yeah, I 
don't think I will go into that one now. Um, there's, a, there's another one at the same site, if you go to that. I had made a slide off of that, but it seems that I inadvertently shut that one. Um, if you go to the site, this is a very nice description of this with the U.S. Geological Survey. They not only have this thickness of the crust there, um, but they have the age of the crust on there. And in fact, let me see if I've got that still up on here. You can see some of the things that I was looking at this morning. Um, This is, yeah, how thick is the Earth's crust? This is the one, the site you saw there. Yeah. So on this site, the other thing that I found here that I thought was really nice for you to look at, um, it's right here. So this is, this is a map that's also from the U.S. Geological Survey, um, just where you saw that map that was on the thickness of the crust. And what I like about this one, this one is showing the age of the last thermotectonic event. So what we know is that our, our crust, our land, um, is, is being constantly overturned, right? I mean, it's... It's on a geological time scale for sure, right? But it's, it's being recycled in that. And what you see here is that, you know, here are these different ages, you know, um, Meso, Paleozoic, Late Paleozoic, Middle Paleozoic, all back to the Archean. And so the Archean, right, that's getting back to the time where, you know, our estimates are for where life began, when life began. And what you see is that, we actually have right, patches around the world right, that um, different places where some of the rocks, some of the land dates that far back. And so this is, this is a great resource for uh, geologists to go pull out rocks that can be 1 billion, 2 billion, even over 3 billion years old, as we've seen, and look for fossils in there. Um, some of the first fossils that showed up for the Precambrian uh, era of evolution, those that were the microfossils, right, um, were found actually up here, just over the border in the U.S. into Canada. And you see that that makes sense because you see that's the oldest of the rocks that are exposed, and that's in dipping down right there. And um, a professor. Uh, by the name of Tyler, was up there actually looking for ore deposits and iron ore deposits that might be good to mine. And he was uh, from Michigan. Why, why might Michigan in the 1950s be interested in finding iron ore deposits? Car industry. Car industry, right? So something very practical. Right? He goes up from Michigan over into Canada and he's looking He's looking for um, iron, what might be a good source of iron, the ore. And uh, the story of, of him finding that is, is, is given in this book by Bill Schaff. Again, this one on uh, finding the, the oldest fossils on Earth, the cradle of life. And uh, it's quite interesting in, in, in the story about it. He, he goes up there and he does find some very old rocks. They're not what he was looking for, but he realizes that these rocks, you know, by the color, they have probably have carbon in them. They're, they're black. They're looking black. And uh, he also realizes that they're probably on the order of two billion years old. And he thinks that that's interesting. And he takes them back, and 
he cuts them apart and looks at them under a microscope. And when he does, he, found, he finds some uh, very small fossils. And uh, this, is, this is also out of, uh, this is just one example out of Schaff's book. Um, but some of the images that eventually uh, are published from what are called the gunflint uh, formations up in Canada uh, have what are believed to be these microorganisms. And look at this. This is the scale there is 10 microns. And Bill Schaff has made a model of what this organism looks like. Okay, so the way that you're able to know what this looks like in 3D is that you have many examples of it in one place and they're kind of rotated around. And what you see here, he took a cocktail umbrella and he stuck it into a piece of candy there, which I think is pretty funny. Um, but that's, that's his model of what this is. This is really interesting because it shows that by this time there was a great diversity of life single cell life on Earth. If you look through the book, you look through the original paper on this, you see many different morphologies. But what's also interesting about this is that a good number of them don't look like anything we know in life today. So life at different times has essentially tried out different shapes, you might say, different ways of surviving, and some went out and some didn't. And this is dating really far back. And some of the questions that we'll discuss have been brought up because, as Wells and Beta said, there could have been molecules that were uh, used early on that are not used anymore, right? And uh, somehow, on the molecular level, we had molecules winning out. Well, we also had shapes, right? organisms winning out. I think that's pretty interesting. Okay. Now yeah, let's go back. Okay. So um, at one point in the book you mentioned um, how there are like thermophilic bacteria that live near geysers like today. Um, and that got me thinking about like extreme So basically, archaea, is, it's one of the three domains of life. There's eukarya, prokarya, and archaea. And they're just, they're, I mean, I thought that they were pretty similar to bacteria, but on the little circle graph, the blue is prokarya, so all yeah. bacteria, and the red is, pro, or red is eukarya, so yeah. plants and animals and stuff. And then the green is archaea, so we're actually more related to archaea. But it's thought to be one of the oldest lineages. Um, on Earth, and I was thinking that we could probably like learn a lot about the origin of life if we studied them. I don't know if there's like research going on about this. I didn't look that far into it, but um, because yeah, I guess you can go to the next. One. Okay. And a lot of archaea are extremophiles. It's not exclusive. Like there are archaea that aren't extremophiles, and there are extremophiles that aren't archaea. But um, anyways, extremophiles occupy niches in extreme conditions, like extremely hot or acidic, salty, extremely dark. And I thought that these conditions would, um, in some cases, reflect those of the early Earth, like the heat, um, like near terminal storms or ocean vents. And um, just the whole Earth was thought to be pretty hot. And um, high salinity, at like one point in the book, it mentioned that the oceans might have been saltier than they are today. and then low sunlight because the atmosphere was like super thick and smoggy and stuff. Um, so I was thinking that it would make sense if it's the oldest lineage um, just because so many of the archaea do still live in conditions that reflect those of the early earth. And then as I was, yeah, you can go to the next one. As I was um, researching, I found an interesting connection to panspermia. There are some astrobiologists that um, are interested in studying extremophiles because the conditions that they live in on Earth are known to exist on other planets. Um, for example, there are the microbes that I found near hydrothermal vents, there are um, vents like that in the subsurface water of Europa. 
um, one of Jupiter's moons. And also, there were microbes found in a lake buried, um, like, I think it said it was like over a mile deep in the Antarctic ice. Um, and there could be regions like that in Mars with subsurface permafrost. So they were thinking, like, might have come from other planets. Um, but you can go to the next one. But as we know, that's probably very unlikely. But um, I thought this connection was still really interesting because we could use that knowledge in the future, like probably very far in the future, I don't know. But um, to maybe more specifically and accurately look for life on other planets. So that was fantastic. So in fact, you have hit on like three or four major research projects that people have been working on for their whole lives, okay? And so congratulations to you in reading one chapter and thinking about it. You have proposed what is been sustained research projects for people for decades, okay? So, um, and, and that's great. And in fact, one of my colleagues has said, um, you know, that if you're if you're a really good scientist in the afternoon, you can come up with an idea that you'll spend the rest of your life working on. So <laughs> you've done it over, okay, multiple times in this, okay? Um, this is great. I, I, I could spend classes on each one of those, and we will talk about some of these ideas that you brought up. I, but I, I reserve myself from getting too far into it, otherwise we'll spend this whole class on, on it. And I want to get through more. Back to your your suggestion that uh, potentially by studying this tree of life and these organisms, we can learn about the origin of life. Absolutely. And that's called the top-down approach. You know, that's, right, as, as you know, you're looking at them and, and understanding more about them. But the thing that I was kind of struck when you said that with this connection with archaea is that this tree was found by Carl Woese and George Fox uh, because they were trying to understand early evolution. So I think that that's a neat connection. You're saying we, we have this tree and maybe by studying that tree we could understand it, but they actually, they actually developed it the other way. It popped out okay, unexpectedly in a sense. Now, the, um, we'll talk more later about the ribosome, which is of course a protein RNA complex that's responsible for synthesizing proteins in all cells. And Carl Woese, who, is, who just died this last year um, in his 80s, maybe 90s, he, he um, was pretty old. Back in 1960s, he had an idea that by studying the sequences of RNA within the ribosome, that there would be the possibility of understanding the evolution of organisms. And the reason he picked the ribosome was that he knew that it existed in all organisms. And also, it's central. It's so central to life. You know, as, as as my colleague Lauren Williams and, and some others have, have said, is that the ribosome, because it takes the code and translates it, it's, it's like the operating system of a computer. And although you can update your programs and, and add more files to your computer, you really don't change the operating system. Because if you do, right, what happens? Yeah, the whole thing falls apart. Oh, the whole thing falls apart, right? Even, even when Microsoft says it won't, right? right? Every, and you laugh because you've had this problem, right? When it says, time to update your operating system, we're all like, no, even though they say it's going to be OK, right? You had the experience, and I have too. Or, and and we, have, we have computers running in my lab now that, uh, that have an operating system that's something like Windows NT that they had out for like a year or so um, over 10, 15 years ago, and we can't update that computer because that software on there won't run on anything but that one operating system, right? So we're like stuck with this ancient one that won't hook us to the internet or anything, right? It's, it's you know. Okay, but that, the analogy is very good there, and, and I think Woz appreciated this, that this central machinery then would not be changing 
very fast. It'd be changing very slowly if it does. And in that way, you could use it to kind of run back time over vastly different organisms. And so they started doing that. And we will go through some of those early papers later on. But just to summarize what their results were is that they were seeing um, differences between what were bacteria and looking at the ribosome and what were eukaryotes. But then when they did one of the types of analyses that they did, there were a group of organisms that didn't fit with either bacteria or uh, with eukaryotes. I mean, what, a, what an incredible moment, right, in science. And in fact, um, George Fox said that when the first data came out, Carl Wills ran into the lab and said, we've discovered a new branch of life, a new type of life, right? But they hadn't still proved it, but he had the insight that this could be it. But that led to redrawing the tree of life. I mean, what, what an incredible discovery that happened not all that long ago. Okay, so that's why I think it's a, it was very insightful. Like you, as you say, we can learn a lot about the original life. That is, that is an understatement, right? So much of what we know is coming from those types of analysis that led to this tree, and then that tree in turn gives back to us an understanding evolution. Okay. Um, also, we were talking about um, these extremophiles here. Um, this is something as well that um, the, the point you made that the extremophiles, a lot of them being these archaea, like to or can live next to very hot, very um, salty environments that some, for other, completely other reasons, we tend to associate with some uh, ideas for the origin of life, right? That that might be what that might be the location where life gets started, right? Yeah, that, that can be a big stretch because we do have reasons why we think there would have been a lot of this type of geothermal activity, but it doesn't necessarily mean that life started right on there. However, it's a, it's a good enough hypothesis that there could be this connection that there have been a lot of people that have been looking at archaea as potentially the first organisms that came about. Now, it looks like it's much more complicated, and when you look at... When you go back and look at this tree, it doesn't look like it's archaea splitting off and going to bacteria. It, you know, it doesn't look like that. If anything, what's looking like is that inside here, they're all diverging from some common ancestor. So it's kind of hard to say that one of these is really that much older than the other at this point. Okay. Um, and then the, the last point that you, you made here that I think is is, is, is really astute is that by studying these different types of organisms we can think about where life might exist other places and that is actually something that NASA funds um, looking at extremophiles because one of NASA's missions is to understand the extent and evolution of life in the universe and our best example of life of course is life here today and in order to understand the spread of life, we do have to understand, at, at least on our planet, what are the extremes that it can, it can exist in, right? And I think that decades ago, people would not have believed that living organisms can be in frozen material, but we know that that's very true now. And they would not have believed that you could have them in boiling hot springs, but we know that's true. So we've got that whole range of water from solid to liquid where life can exist now. Yes? So, if anything, we're trying not to do that. Um, like you said, it wouldn't be ethical, and that's an interesting question about Martian ethics, right? Is it ethical for us to put things on, on Mars and that? And uh, that is, when probes are sent up, they are making sure that they're sterile for the reason that we don't introduce anything up there. The idea is that, you know, from for all of time, we want to maintain those environments as, as pristine. And so there, there's you know, actually the thought that something could 
come from Earth and go there and, and spread. Now, I think it's very unlikely the atmosphere is, is so different in the, in the terrain and there's no, as we, not a readily available food source for the organisms like we have on Earth, right? Anyway, because of the abundance of life, right? Mold grows on everything, right? Well, that's because there's all this naturally derived material all over our Earth. You don't really have that as far as we know in these other environments. So I think that the, the likelihood that it would get started if we tried to seed it over there is extremely small because of the conditions that are necessary. But yet, we're being very cautious not to do that. Um, I'm not sure about that. You know, there are ones like with respect to Antarctica and that to try to keep areas pristine and that. Um, I, I'm really not sure about whether we've got a treaty about Mars, right? Whether not to put anything out there. Okay, so any questions for Kayla on what she brought up? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. How's that? Is that a little bit better? Okay. So, any questions for Kayla on all these? Yep. Got it. Very nice. Okay. Uh, Nicole, let's come back to hers because if we run out of time, we will, uh, because she's out sick today, we'll come back to hers next time. Andy, you're up. <laughs> yeah, I like your dynamic uh, image there. Thanks. So the chap, um, so the chapter mentioned um, the uh, amino acids in the Murkowski meteorite and how they turned out to have a, um, a L dominance slightly, and that was also. So I, I was interested in this and looking into the paper and the book, I uh, found two, theor two theories that I thought were interesting on how the amino acids grew to be L-dominant. The first one is this, the circularly polarized light. Basically, this is light which has, uh, you know, light is an electromagnetic wave, it travels along travels in a transverse direction, that's the straight line it's going in, but you have an oscillating electric and magnetic field. This, these two GIFs are just showing the electric field, because otherwise it would be very cluttered. But anyway, you have these uh, light waves going, and these light waves, um, uh, I think it was Bonner, mm -hmm. William Bonner, who uh, hypothesized that as the Murkison meteorite was traveling through space, uh, you had this kind of light coming from some source. He said it could have been a neutron star. You had this kind of light coming into the source. And this kind of light, um, since it's circularly polarized, it is. it can be both right or left-handed, just like our enantiomers that we know in organic chemistry. Um, and, he, and he hypothesized that the, this kind of light will photolyze, and that's just lysing due to uh, light activity. Uh, only one species of enantiomer, and maybe that could explain the abundance of only one type. So that's the light, and the other uh, hypothesis I found interesting was um, this light. So we have this uh, Strecker synthesis um, of forming amino acids from aldehydes and ketones. Like, uh, so an aldehyde is, uh, you have a terminal, you have a double bonded oxygen at the end of a R group, and the ketone is you have a double oxygen connecting two R groups, a double bonded oxygen, yeah. So I found some papers that uh, showed that you can't, you can do an antiomeric selection uh, using a chiral catalyst. Um, 
basically you have a catalyst with a certain handedness that will only produce only one kind of uh, enantiomer of the resultant acid. So I guess the main discussion point is what um, which of these theories do you think is more plausible or are there any other theories that you might think of? Because there are admittedly problems with both. The problem with the CPL is that um, most mainly how could it have reached the meteorite? Like, could it have gone inside or was there enough time for it in transit? Or uh, uh, was there something in the way? And the problem with uh, Strecker synthesis that I seem to find is that the paper that I find that could manage to do this enantiomeric selection, um, most of their reactants and catalysts were very specific or complex. So may maybe something like that couldn't exist in this meteorite. But what do you all think? What were the sort of catalysts? Were they transition metals? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think I recall one of them being like a, some crazy molecule with zirconium in it. Oh, okay. Well, um, my discussion points on something similar, but if you uh, started out with a chiral excess of like a nickel complex or something, that's a transition metal that's relatively common. Mm -hmm. um, then yeah, I think that could lend some credibility to the second basis. Okay, but wait a minute. Okay. Have you not just push the problem back one step. You want it? We, we, we can, let's go, here's what we can do is that, because you have some points that are on here, what we can do is we can meld yours right in. That's one reason I put your slides right after, and um, because I'll talk some more about the circularly polarized light, we can get that, but I was thinking since you talked about that as well, would you like, why don't we interject yours and then we can have a more of a discussion on, on, on all of these points if you like, if you've got something. Okay, so um, as we read, Pasteur was able to take a solution of tartaric acid, and this was a racemic solution, and when you recrystallize the tartaric acid, it naturally separates into dextrone level crystals. So that's important because you start out with a system which macroscopically had no chirality. If you put it in an instrument that measures chirality, you would get no turn of uh, plain polarized light. But if you were to sort out these crystals and then dissolve them again, you would have, from a system that originally had no chirality, a macroscopic system that had chirality. So you have the spontaneous emergence of macroscopic chirality. That's important. So, um, okay, so my main point is, are, is that phenomenon limited to crystals of tartaric acid or can it happen elsewhere in the universe? So imagine that during the, uh, formation of the solar system. You had these dust particles that were aggregating into things that became asteroids, planets, so forth. Similar to crystallization, right? So is it possible that from a mixture of chemicals, which was uh, racemic, that you could have some localities in, a, in an asteroid that were of a certain chirality and other localities that were of another? And if that were true, so Beta and Wills discuss uh, geochromatography. And in the paper we read, uh, chromatography was used to purify these enantiomers. But since enantiomers interact identically in achiral environments, the stationary phase that they used for chromatography had to be chiral. That's important because we see that one macroscopically chiral environment can give rise to another. So even if you could have these amino acids which don't, crystallize out into uh, their L and D forms. If you have other you know, minerals or other types of organic molecules that do, they could, through a process of geochromatography, separate out these enantiomers. And the sample of the Murchison meteorite that Cronin and Pizzarella uh, studied, that just might have happened to be the part of the meteorite that had the L enantiomer more than the D enantiomer. Um, so, yeah, so how would that affect the conclusion of their paper? Wouldn't that mean that, well, maybe it's not true that in the solar system there was an excess of the L enantiomer of this particular amino acid? So. 
I think that's very reasonable. In fact, that was the explanation that was proposed to me by Frank Annette, somebody, a scientist that I studied under as a postdoc. Uh, and he had said pretty much the same thing, saying, sure, I can believe that there would be an excess of one-handedness in a meteorite. And he went a bit of a step further on it, which was, he said, you know, with a meteorite that's out there and you know, could be forming and you know, we don't know at what point all the activity stopped, but it could be plenty of time you know, that it was forming, maybe even a, you know, millions, if not billions of years, you could have had um, some movement of material in there. If, as you say, that certain molecules, a particular handedness, well, a hand, one handedness will like to crystallize with itself rather than right, with his racemate, with, it, with his other handedness. Um, then what you would expect is that they would start to, these would like would start to collect with like. And just like you said, that if that happened, then the chunk of the Murchison meteorite that was studied or the chunk that fell to Earth might be the one that actually got more of this one handedness of the crystals than the other. Um, that, that makes sense, right? Now, the step further that Frank was talking about, too, is that uh, when, when you crystallize out these amino acids, you make a crystal or other molecules, then that may be also stabilizing that handedness. And because it's in this crystal matrix. And as we talked last time a little bit about, right, we, we can actually have the handedness convert on some molecules like amino acids. And so what you could imagine is that, is that you might start out where it's perfectly racemic mixture and that over time, you know, it kind of tips, right? You start to build up excess of one crystal because you're exchanging between kind of a, a, a bath or a solution or something with, with one, but they're, they're switching their handedness in the crystals. It kind of tips over and builds up on one side. So it's kind of a random, or as we say, stochastic event on which way it goes. But you might expect that that, that could happen. Um, so it could be that over time it shifted one way, or that spatially they, the crystals formed and, and, and separated but random. And we're not talking huge excesses here either, right? So in some ways it seems that this might be kind of statistics of small numbers of molecules or small space and that you just need to average over the whole meteorite, which we can't take it and we don't want to take it and grind it all up. Or, or it might be that we have to average over the parent body this came from or over the whole solar system, right? Um, and then we'll see that they're both handednesses that are in equal amount. So, so I agree with you. It's, it looks like it's there, but the source of it is still not understood, for sure. Okay. Yes. Yeah, but this is, you're getting you're getting immersed right into it, right? So this is good. Ask anything. Yeah. Definitely not the main body at all. But how likely would it be to have like a see evidence of some striation within this sample versus like a larger body versus assuming let's say that this probably is more representative of either one side versus like actually like containing different like layers? Because I know I was in the article that like not every sample they they measured was actually significant. A few of them actually weren't. So I was wondering if there was like you know like sort of like stirring the striation of that if that was likely or not. Yeah, and, and it could be. It could be that these are separated. And, and you have to think about um, on what degree level this is because you know, when, you know, they, when they're taking a piece of this meteorite, this is incredibly precious material, right? So as you can imagine, you know, just to get a sample of it, right, you have to be a you know, pretty prominent scientist and you apply and ask, may I have some and do an analysis of it, right? So it's like, it's to stand a, Pizzarello's credit that she, you know, with all of her knowledge and abilities that, you know, she was able to obtain some of this material and analyze it. 
but that material might be this little chunk right here, right? right? And what you're saying is that, yeah, you know, there, there, there might have been some layering over here. It's a little different. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah, you know, why not? Um, and and if, if it's the same here, well, maybe it's the same here, but maybe over here it's a, it's a little different, right? Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And we don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know that we ever will because I, I just can't imagine that we're going to take this whole thing right. and grind it up, right? That's, that's a little much, right? You know, and then you'll, there's so many questions too you'd ask, uh, how finely do you need to grain it? You know, because how, you know, these striations you're saying and separations, how finely separated are these, right? Oof, you know, this is a tough problem all the way. Okay. Um, let's go back to this for one second. We were talking about that idea that maybe the molecules that were synthesized were synthesized by a chiral catalyst, right, with the aid of a chiral catalyst, and that gave rise to one-handedness. So what's, what's an example of chiral catalysis today? What's that? Enzyme. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> you have to laugh, right, because it's, it's a trick question in that it's so easy, right, because it's everywhere, right? Every, I mean, all you have to say is me, a plant, right? right? Because what we have in life is we're using the L amino acids, right, and not the D, and they're being synthesized, and they're being synthesized with the aid of enzymes, and it's all chiral synthesis, right? And, uh, you know, this, the, the idea of the chiral synthesis is, is pretty simple in that, you know, if you, if you have a chiral compound and, and, you know, you have two hands, right, and you can think about it with respect to your hands, I always talk about it in is that in, in an enzyme or in a, in a catalyst that's chiral, there might be you know, a couple chemical groups that hold on to the molecule and another one that does the chemistry, right? So even if that molecule comes in, you know, for an example, you know, this would be a chiral molecule, but it's going to stick something to one side of it, right? So, you know, if, if if these parts hold onto it and then it gets something stuck on one side, then this could be handedness at that point. Um, but now if you have the same catalyst but the different handedness and it comes in and it attaches it, it attaches it to the other side, right? And so then that way that handedness of, of the enzyme <clears throat> or the more simple catalyst is being transferred to that molecule. And this of course is happening all day long in our bodies, right, in every cell. Question could be, when did this start, okay? Um, certainly at one point it started, and it could have started back in the, as we say, the prebiotic soup, where there might have been polymers that were of one-handedness that were synthesizing more of their building blocks, and they were making the building blocks that they need, and so that could be a chiral cat uh, catalyst at that point. But uh, you know, as being proposed here, maybe it even started a bit further back that there were some chiral compounds. Now, that gets a bit difficult because, again, as I said, that just pushes the question of the origin of chirality back one step. And if we have a chiral um, catalyst spontaneously coming about, we expect that we would spontaneously get both handedness, right? And then we have to say, okay, when did we really break the symmetry of the numbers on that? It just goes back one more step. Um, at some point, again, there has to be this kind of tipping point where we go to one side. And that's where, as we've discussed earlier, it looks more likely, at least in my opinion, that that was a little bit later where we had organisms that were replicating and evolving and could really take over and displace another handedness, right? So something akin to that, if not at the cellular level, something simpler but still doing this kind of evolution and growth. Yes? Yeah, no, do it. Um, yeah, we all learn, right? <laughs> it's good. Is it possible um, or feasible to um, run experiments where you could like synthesize, like obviously synthesize um, like D, uh, replicating cat catalyst, and actually you would synthesize the um, and it, and it, um, species and just like compare them in different environments relative to the L counterparts to see if their survival rates are like as um, applicable or, or as we would expect, maybe lower. To actually test that, I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay, so, 
Well, well they talk about something similar. I think you're taking it one step further. You know, they, they do talk that about how you can take an enzyme that's of our L-handedness and then translate it into the D-handedness, and then it will work on a substrate, what an enzyme does a reaction on, that is of the other handedness, right? And that, that's been shown. That you're saying, could you, could you see whether in, in an environment one would survive? Okay, so you have to think about that at a few levels, okay? The, how the experiment would go. Um, it's kind of different, it's kind of difficult to say that we could take a replicating molecule and put it out in our environment because if we make something that's a minimal or artificial replicating molecular system, we put it on the environment, it's not going to really do anything because in the, in the laboratory, it's as if we have it on life support, right? We're giving it things, we're, we're running it through its reactions, right? You know, it's, we're not there yet that we're, we're very far removed from where we can make something that's an artificial living system and throw it out in the environment and expect that, you know, it, it's going to survive. Okay. Yeah, we're way off from that. Okay, but we can do the thought experiment, okay? So let's imagine, you know, we're a couple centuries ahead and our synthetic chemistry, our molecular biology is so good that what we can do is we can make a whole cell, okay? A whole cell that is all the amino acids. Right? Now we can do your experiment, right? Okay, so now I put this thought experiment to you, which is that if we make an organism that is completely the, the other handedness and we put it out in an environment and we make one that's identical or we take the natural one and we put it out in the environment, which one's going to survive better? Are they going to be the same? You think they'll be the same? It depends on the environment you yeah. put it in. The okay. current environment, it will always be the L. I'm assuming. Okay, why? Because everything in nature is the L, so it wouldn't be able to sustain itself if it was the L. Oh, that's right. I'm not sure. No, that's no, you're right on. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right on. Okay, anybody want to take it further? Why? Yeah, why? You say, you say, you said it right. It won't be able to sustain itself. Why? Um, I'm, yeah. It's because it would never encounter the D form. Uh, yeah, the D form. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, okay, but what about this though? What if, okay, what if I have an organism that is um, able to survive off of methane and ammonia as a carbon source and a nitrogen source, okay? Now, methane, right, you got your carbon and your four hydrogens off that, it's not chiral. Ammonia, your nitrogen and three hydrogens, it's not chiral, okay? All right, that organism, it can make everything it needs. Now I put both of those out, which one will survive better? Are they genetically identical? They're everything absolutely identical, except one is one-handedness on everything and the other is the other-handedness. So which one's going to survive better? And there's... Okay, you say statistical. This is out in our environment there. And, okay. Andy, what do you think? I'm, I'm just, uh, it's an energy know. argument. You're a physicist, biologist, it's a nutrient argument. Any guesses? So we've got you on the thought experiment to where it's just those two organisms, identical, different handedness. They're going to go out, and I'm going to rub them on a leaf or throw them in the soil. Who's going to survive? Just this, so there's a side for it. It's the same. You're, everybody's going for the same. Yeah? All right. Now, I'm, I'm going to bet on the one that still is our handedness. And I'll tell you why. What's it? The L, which is the for the amino acid side. The reason is, is that even though you have an organism that can take in ammonia, take in methane, and even if it's plentiful, it has to spend a lot of energy right, to make all of the compounds that it needs. We're great, we as in living organisms, Andy's on it, we're great scavengers, we're great recyclers, right? right? So, 
cells, even cells that can make all of their molecules have receptors on the outside that are looking all the time for, is there a free meal, right? Are there amino acids out there that I could take in? Are there sugars out there, right? Are the, the bases of the, of the nucleic acid and taking them in, right? So what you need to think about when you look out there at everything in life, right? You know, it's just, it's, it is this biosphere right from that biomolecule all the way up to you know the the redwoods and the you know the the uh, blue you know whale and that right the biggest things right but that biosphere its handedness is everywhere and we're all connected by this web and it's a really good thing right because it makes it so much easier for all of us right so think about it if an organism decided well I'm gonna switch over to the D amino acids because then nobody will eat me, right? Because I, I'll, I'll be, I won't be nutritious, right? It sounds like a pretty good strategy, right? You know, nothing will eat me because they'll just be wasting their time, right? Or I might be horribly poisonous to them, right? It could be. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so pick your poison, so to speak, right? Nothing to eat me, but I will starve, right? And and, and I think that. I think that that is um, a, a, a lesson there that you know, life is doing this, okay? Life is in that, in that whole web, we're all connected, and life is keeping with the same basic components because we're recycling them all the time. I think that this is where we have these 20 canonical amino acids that are being coded in proteins. And people like Norm Pace at the University of Colorado, who likes to look at biodiversity, has done a lot for the drawing out the tree of life there. He goes, goes deep into caves and finds these organisms that are you know, reducing sulfur or something like that. They're doing some type of uh, uh, chemical energy generation and you know, so far removed from anything on the surface, and yet they're still using the same genetic material. They're still using the same amino acids, right? I think that, that at some point it got so set, it's like this operating system of the computer. And it was not only can you not change it now because it's hard for you, but it got set in a way of don't change it because if you do change it, you have to go about it yourself, right? And so that, you know, it could have been a way where evolution put it to where those organisms that can't change it or go along with it, they get selected, right? Because then they always, they're always able to make use of the free meal that comes along, right? Or it might have gotten set, you know, so far back, right, in these replicating systems before we even had the cells that, that all the machinery got set and there's no way to pull one in. But e either way, it, it comes down to the same conclusion is that we're connected, I think, through this whole recycling, right? And that's incredibly efficient, right? So all we would need if we wanted to be an anti-reverse, just to invert the entire biosphere. That's all we'd have to do is invert the entire biosphere. So there are some people that think that there is another biosphere. Yes, it's, they, they have dubbed it the shadow of biosphere, OK? Now, there's some people think that there may be organisms on Earth that are using the other hand in this. And we just don't see them because all of our instrumentation is geared toward ourselves, right? I think that's very, very hard to believe, okay? Because all of the organisms that we've ever discovered and studied are using the same chemistry that we are, the same handedness, even. And so, you would have to have organisms that we've never seen, so they would probably not be macroscopic because we don't have giraffes walking around that are the other hand in this, right? You'd have to have microscopic ones, and then they would have to be going about it all on their own, right? They would have to be generating all their own, and if they are competing at all with an organism that can do things more efficiently, they would be wiped out, right? So I don't think so. Okay. Any other questions or points on that? Yeah, it's pretty fun, huh? Uh, I had a, I read about a, a possible in a physics book. It was kind of a talking about another possibility where we could have a DNA anti-emerge, but it's kind of 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, probably a long time ago we had both, but not now. Okay. Um, let me see. I've got a few things I want to talk to you about. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about, talked a little bit about this already through your discussion points. I'm going to talk to you, um, let's talk about circular dichroism, okay? Circularly polarized light, okay? Let's put these together. Um, you brought up circularly polarized light. Um, Annie brought it up because there's the idea that out there that a way that an excess of one-handedness of a molecule could be generated is that you start with both handednesses equally and then circularly polarized light, which has a handedness to it. It's, it's rotating one direction as it propagates, right? And you could have one that in our right-handed rule of the world that it's rotating you know, one direction, we call that right-handed polarized light, but if it's rotating another direction, we call that left-handed polarized light. Now, has anybody, have any of you heard of circularly polarized light before? You have, yeah, yeah. Andy has, okay. It, it's, it's a different concept, isn't it? When you think about polarized light, you think about you're going to take a polarizer and you know that, that light, right, has a, has a um, propagation, right, direction and if we don't have polarized light, we have that electromagnetic wave pointing in all directions. We put a polarizer in only the light that's polarized along one axis, right, uh, is the light that we have. Um, but circularly polarized light, what actually happens is that that wave, that amplitude fluctuation that we have, isn't fluctuating in amplitude. It's fluctuating or it's changing in its direction. So the intensity of that wave is staying the same, but it's rotating around the propagation vector. Kind of strange, huh? Really different. Okay, so, you know, when I first heard about that, I said, what? That doesn't make sense. Because you would think that, you would think that everything we learned about light waves, you must, right, oscillate in amplitude. How could it be that it stays the same amplitude, but it rotates around? Okay. Um, way that you can think about that is, let's think about this. So think about light propagating. <coughs> okay, so we'll look at this. And this is how we, we, we usually think about what we would call you know, linearly polarized light. Right? So I've, I put this on an axis here, right? and it's, right, it's in this plane of my y-axis. Right? So everybody agrees with that. If I put a polarizer right here, right, plane this way, I generate that type of light. Okay. So now imagine this, that I'm going to put along the same direction another wave of light. It's going to be equal in amplitude, okay, but I'm going to polarize it in this x direction, okay, like that, okay. So now, right, what, what you could imagine with this is that the sum of these, right, well, I'm now the sum of these is what my electromagnetic wave is, right? So now, in the sum of these, I'm actually right, off at a 45 degree angle. I'm still oscillating, right, if I have those in phase, but I've rotated this, right? So that's one way to, to think about hmm, two waves coming together, right? And, and then you've got a, a net to it, right? Another way we can think about this, imagine this, is that Let's look down, let's look down this axis. We put our eye here and we're looking down this axis here. And 
what we're going to look at as we look down this axis, we're going to look at the oscillation of this light. And that light, it will go up in amplitude, right? And then it'll go down in amplitude, and it'll go negative, and it'll go back, right? It's going up and down like that, right? So what I can propose to you is that now, as we look down that axis here, that I actually, I don't really have one plane of light like that. What I have are two waves of light, like I said here, right? But instead, they're maintaining their same amplitude, and one is rotating one way, and run, one is rotating the other way. Okay, so we can think about it that way. Now, if I take what is the net vector of this, right? When it starts out like this, it's actually twice this intensity. They add together, right? And then as I go a quarter wavelength away, either in time or space as I go along it, right? They're opposite like that, right? And so now I'm at a null, right? When I add those two together. So hopefully in that real brief description here, I've convinced you that I could make linearly polarized light by putting together two circularly polarized waves, right? So this is actually connected to this idea of optical rotation, okay? Because imagine now that I take my linearly polarized light and I put it through a sample that absorbs one handedness more than the other, okay? Now, that sample doesn't know that this is linearly polarized light versus a left and a right handed, right? It's mathematically, physically, it's the same. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to put a sample that absorbs a, say, left handed rotating light more than the right handed, okay? And what will happen is that if I look at this now, in this case right here, that vector, the one that's spinning to the left, is smaller because it got absorbed. Right? So now, if you take this and you add up the component vectors of it, then instead of having circularly polarized light, what do you have? You mean instead of having linearly polarized? What's it? Yeah. He said instead of circular. Yeah, no, no, instead of, oh, sorry. Okay, so, yeah, it's not linear. Very good. And then these two are not circular. Actually, what you, what you end up with is something that's, um, instead of being right along this plane like it was, right, it turns out to be that it's rotated, okay? And it's actually an ellipse, and it's a very thin ellipse, okay, on there. So you can end up with a, actually a rotation and so that, that all connects to this idea of optically active, okay? A solution of randomly oriented molecules will be optically active if the molecules are asymmetric. The optical activity can be seen as the rotation of linearly polarized light due to the difference in the refractive index for the two types of circularly polarized light, okay, called optical rotary dispersion or by the difference in the absorption of the two types of circularly polarized light called circular dichroism. So this is, you know, with, without going through this, I think that this is kind of a crazy concept, right? That, that you have linearly polarized light and you've got, you've got absorption of circularly polarized light in one hand of this versus another, right? But, but you don't have circularly polarized, you have linear. But actually you do if you, have a, if you think about them as these two components being together, okay? So this is out of a biochemistry textbook, and this is an example of measuring optical rotation. And this is exactly the, the physics that we're talking about. You have a light source. You have a fixed polarizer. So we're getting that linearly polarized light. And then if we have our optically active substance in here, which could be our tartaric acid or our sugars that we sorted out crystals of one-handedness and put in there, then what will happen is that our light will rotate in there. OK? 
Okay? And we'll see that because what we'll see is that as we're looking at the intensity of the light, we can then take this other polarizer and rotate it until we see the most intense signal. Right? And if this got rotated, then we rotate that along. Now, this is perfect that, that in Vogt and Vogt and Pratt, they put somebody that looked like he came out of the Renaissance time there, because this is the older way that we, we do it. We, you can still do that today, but we usually use circular dichroism. So what we do is we create circularly polarized light, left and right-handed, and then we measure the difference in the absorption of those two handedness. Now, just as I told you that you could take two waves and have them in phase, but rotate it from each other by 45 degrees, add them together, and make a, a, a wave that was rotated at 45 degrees. If I take those two waves and I shift them with respect to each other by 45 degrees in their phase, or by what we call a quarter wave there, right? Or 90 degrees, rather. It's a, it's a 90 degrees, not 45. Um, what we have then in this quarter wave plate here, what we have then is the generation of a vector of what that will be rotating around that axis. Okay, starting out now where we had we had the two components at 90 degrees with respect to each other, and we're going to retard one of those a quarter away from the other. And add it together, they'll be circularly polarized. If we retard one with respect to the other, we'll get right-handed, and the other one will get the left-handed. Okay? And so then, you take that and you can measure the difference in the absorption of the left and the right. And in normal absorption, everything is positive as we read it, because a, a, a molecule doesn't generate photons or light. It just absorbs them or doesn't absorb them, right? So that's all that's a positive. In circular dichroism, as you see, this is the delta absorption here. There's plus scale and minus scale because sometimes it's measure, it's, it's absorbing positive circularly polarized light and sometimes it's absorbing negatively or in some wavelengths. Okay? So this is what circular dichroism shows us and this is the modern instrument that we have in our, in our lab where in, in right here on the tabletop here, we're generating the, the left and right hand circular polarized light, putting a sample in here, and then measuring uh, the, the difference in that absorption and bringing that into the computer. Okay, so that's, that's the, uh, the real short intro to <laughs> circular dichroism and circularly polarized light. But it's an important concept with respect to you know, understanding what that light is like and how we can use it to detect differences, right, in handednesses of samples. Okay, that's enough for now.